I also uh, want to thank everyone who was here for Trunk or Treat. We did have a great turnout. It was awesome and it was fun. And, and so I told somebody, I was walking up through there, I'm like, isn't this fun? Because it was just great. You know, it was fun and it was a little chilly, but it wasn't bad. And so I appreciate everybody who had a, uh, gave out candy outside. I appreciate everyone who donated candy. I appreciate everyone who was inside here serving the hot dogs and the hot chocolate and all of that. So we had a good time and the donuts too. So I think we have some of them left, but uh, you guys eat those. I don't need those anyway. Uh, also, because of the time change, I guess I get an extra hour to preach this morning, right? Okay. Sure. Sure. <laughs> uh, hey, I, how the Lord leads. <laughs> yeah, how the Lord leads. I like that. Hey, but I have been working on what will be a, a new sermon series beginning the first of the year. And so, like I said, I've just been going through what the Lord wants to, to say to Calvary this week and next week and, and all that. But I will start a new sermon series probably the first of the year. I'm, I'm I'm planning on that as the Lord leads, though, right? I have to listen to that. And because of my studies, as well as this week's election, the, the day of prayer for the persecuted church, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that Heather just read for us. Now, the first thing about pastors are taught about Bible interpretation is always context, right? Context is king when it comes to understanding the Bible and interpreting the Bible correctly, which means you can't just rip a verse out of a passage and make it stand on its own. You have to examine it within its context. That is, you have to, to see what the verses above it say and, and the verses below it say, what they're about, what the chapter, what the whole chapter is about, the chapter before it, the chapter after it. You have to understand how that passage relates to the rest of the, 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 the book that we're looking at, like how does it, what we're le learning about this morning and studying, how does it relate to the whole book of First Thessalonians, and how does First Thessalonians relate to the rest of all of Scripture, Old and New Testament? So context is king. And so, uh, he, having said all that, here in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the believers at Thessalonica at the church there. They are new believers. They, they are young in their faith. They are suffering severe persecution because they have turned from their old pagan ways and have, have turned and trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Chapter 1 tells them, Paul tells them, God has rescued them from the wrath of God, both the temporal wrath during the tribulation as well as he saved them from eternal wrath as well. He also makes them aware that Jesus is coming back. Chapter 2, Paul tells them the message they received wasn't to, to please men, but it was the truth because he says it was from God, not from men. He says, I can't wait to see you again. And oh, by the way, Jesus is coming back. Chapter 3, Paul told them that he was worried about them and that, it's, that he wanted them to continue in their faith. And, and he was happy to hear a good report from Timothy that they were indeed doing that. And he told them that he was praying for the church there, for them to increase in love for one another, to become holy, to become blameless, to be set apart community, and to accomplish these things before Jesus came back. The message I want to pass on to you this morning is the truth, just like Paul told the Thessalonians the truth here. And the truth is Jesus is coming back. Do I hear you, amen? amen? All right. Man, if I don't get amen for that one, we got, we got a problem. I'll start back. I'll start over. Jesus is coming back, okay? Amen. amen. The, yeah, so we'll get to that part in a little while, but let's look at what Paul wrote to here at the beginning of chapter 4. And I know Heather just read it, but let's read it again. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what the instructions, know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn how to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. And here in chapter 4, Paul begins by reminding the members of the church here in Thessalonica what he had taught them previously while he was there in person. He says, let me remind you what I taught you before. Let me, let me remind you. And he taught them that instructions produce godly lives. Right? Instructions produce godly lives. And we have to have instructions in our lives, right? We have to know what to do, how to do it, when to do it, in a way that is proper. You can't really do anything without some kind of instructions. Uh, you can't begin a new job unless you know what to do. So somebody comes alongside you and says, this is how we do it. Well, it, and you do it that way. 
you might think it's kind of an odd way of doing something, but you do it anyway because that's the way you do it. You get the instructions. You get paid to do it that way. Um, and so Paul begins here with finally, and you can tell he's a preacher because he, he says the word finally and he goes on for two more chapters here, but it's not like he's like wrapping up this letter here. This is not like an ending part. It's not concluding his thoughts. He's actually just switching gears. This is a transition statement. In these last two chapters, Paul will instruct them and point out some things that they might not have right, some things that they're missing, some things that they don't know, some things they don't understand. And these instructions were not really intended to cause them to behave any differently, nor cause them uh, to change the way they were doing things. From the report Timothy brought back to Paul concerning the church there, they were doing okay. The people were living the best that they could considering they were living in a, a, a very sinful society and they were suffering severe persecution. Timothy's like, you know what, Paul? These guys are doing pretty good. They're, they're, you, we were worried about them, but there's nothing to worry about. They're, they're kind of on track here. They just, they just need you to fill in the blanks. So basically, Paul encouraged them to do more of the same and keep going to increase the good they were doing. And these instructions, these rules, if you will, are for a purpose. Because following instructions, obeying the word of God, produces godly lives. That, it, that pleases God. Lives that please God. And that's what Paul says here. To, we instructed you on how to live in order to please God. That's what it's all about. And if you're a believer in Jesus, I think this is right where we are all at this morning. What I mean is, if you have repented and put, of your sins and put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you, you come to church, maybe you even serve here at Calvary. But like Paul is telling the Thessalonians, there is much, much more to be done. Got to keep going, got to keep growing, got to keep serving, got to do more and more. You can't rest on what you've already accomplished. You have to keep going, you have to keep growing in your faith. And here's the thing about growing in your faith. It is a lifelong process. Verse 2. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual morality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. Paul told them to be sanctified. If you're a born-again believer, sanctification is the segment of your salvation that you're currently in. It's the, it's the part of your salvation you are currently in. Because the Bible talks about Christians in three different aspects. Those who have been saved. Those who are being saved. Those who will be saved. Those who have been saved are probably all of us here this morning. If you're a believer, you're justified. You've been saved. You're good to go. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You will, you will live with Jesus forever. That's past tense. You were saved. Justified. And, and so, all believers today, uh, okay, and then when you, there's a part where you will be saved. You will be saved when you're glorified, when you're with Jesus, when you're in heaven with Jesus, when you're living with Jesus, when you get your new, your new body. You will be glorified. You will be saved. Glorification. And all believers here today are still being saved. That is our sanctification. That is not that we, we don't know Jesus, not that he, 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 we're not his children, but we're in the process of sanctification of being saved, right? And it's a lifelong process. And what that means is we are becoming to be more Christ-like. We become more Christ-like in our thoughts, in our speech, in our actions, and Paul says here to the church in Thessalonica, keep growing, keep changing, grow to become, to look more like Jesus. Now some denominations and some faiths believe that you're fully sanctified at the moment of your conversion. I think they just have justification and sanctification mixed up, to be honest with you. Then there are some who believe that you can become fully sanctified, that is, you can become so sanctified and so fully sanctified that, to the point that you don't sin anymore. What I see in the Bible is that as long as you're still here on this earth, there's room to grow. There's room for improvement. So it is a real lifelong process. And as we grow in our faith, 
And we live like different set apart people in this wicked world. What we see here also is we should respect, we should value respect over dominance. As I said, the Thessalonians lived a very sinful culture. As a matter of fact, all the places that Paul went on his missionary journeys were very sinful places. But it was Jesus that changed at least some of the people we, like we see here. In verse 3, Paul says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that he should learn how to control his own body. Okay? And verse 6, And that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we've already told you and warned you. Obviously, Thessalonica here at this time was a very sexually immoral place. There was casual use of prostitutes. There was a practice of ritual prostitution in, in certain cults. This was commonplace in, in places like Thessalonica. It was very common for rich men to have many mistresses. New believers in Jesus struggled with new beliefs and new instructions of what was to them a new, actually a new sexual code of conduct. And, and you got to remember, they are living in a very sexually permissive society. We have to consider that one of the greatest challenges of a new convert was living according to the truth of God's word. Very difficult. Paul says, keep going. Keep doing. Do it more and more. And right in the middle of telling them that that's God's will for them, to live a different lifestyle from the people that are around them, he says, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. Again, this is where we as Christians today are at. Tuesday is the presidential election. Do I need to say more? I'm afraid, and, and I hope I'm wrong, but I have a feeling that even when the vote is cast and the president is chosen, it's not going to be over. It may just be getting started, right? I want to remind you that God is in control no matter who wins the race. Jesus Christ, the one who is coming back, by the way, has all authority. It says so in Matthew 28. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you even to the end of the very age. The world tells you, get what you can. Become famous, become rich, portray yourself to be better than the people around you. We talked about this in Bible group this morning. Stand up, speak up, fight for your rights, even if you have to resort to violence. But the Lord says, just what Paul says, be different. Don't act like that. Don't bring that attitude into the church is basically what he's saying. Value respecting others over being the, the more dominant person. This election week, respect other believers' decisions over what you believe was the right way to vote. But what we see here with this church is it's not enough to know how to live a godly life, you must do it. And here's where it comes in, where we talked about this in Bible group this morning. Actions speak louder than words. Verse 7, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. You can say you're a follower of Jesus. You can come to church every Sunday. You can serve on a committee. You can serve on a board. But if you're not living a godly life, if you're not growing in your faith, if, if, if indeed you are actually going backwards, then you're not living a life that is pleasing to God. Because God has not called us to an impure life, but a holy life, set apart a different kind of life. I like the way the King James Version says it. Uh, verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. I love that Paul makes it very clear that if you talk the talk, but you're not walking the walk, you're not disobeying what he taught. You're not disobeying any other, what any other person says. You're disobeying God and you're rejecting his teaching. 
And I put here that actions speak louder than words, but it's not so much even actions. And he's talking about what they were doing with their physical bodies here, but it's not so much even that. Because impure actions always begin with impure thoughts. And impure thoughts are where many of us dwell. Most of the time, our struggle isn't so much what we do physically. It's not how we behave. It's not what we do to others. It's how we think. It's what's in here, right? It's what and how we think. But as I said, our sanctification is a process. It's a lifelong journey that we're on. So don't quit. Don't give up. Don't say, you know, I, I go to church. I, I read my Bible. I just, things just don't work out for me. I think I'll just give up. No, don't do that. Keep going. Keep growing. Because when it comes to following Jesus and really living for him, it's the Holy Spirit that produces the love. Verse 9. Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. In this letter, as I mentioned, Paul has covered a lot of information concerning godly living and to be prepared for Jesus' return. And here in chapter 4, verse 9, he says, now concerning brotherly love. And then he goes on and talks about it. After exhorting them to live pure lives and respect one another, we see here there's more to it than that. We see that just because we're expected to do these things, we can't actually accomplish anything on our own. Paul tells them, he, and he's telling us, by the way, as, as we read this, you already know this stuff. I, how many times have you guys heard a sermon about God's love, right? Tons. You already know this stuff. And that's what he's saying. You guys, even they knew this stuff. They're young Christians. They're young believers, but they knew about this. He's basically saying, yes, you have learned this teaching from me, but it, it's God that implants this truth of love on your hearts. It's the Holy Spirit working in your lives and working through the Word of God that teaches us about real love, agape love, sacrificial love, a serving kind of love that helps us to love others. Verse 9. Now, brotherly love, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. Romans 5.5 5 says, And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. And as we see here, and this is, this is important, because the church grows when love grows. Verse 10. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you brothers to do so more and more. The church back then was growing like crazy. Even in a sexually depraved and sinful culture, even during extreme persecution, the church was growing. People were being saved, not only from their eternal damnation, but they were being saved from their destructive lifestyles that they were previously living in. It's the same today. And, I, it, and yes, God saves you for eternity, but there's so much more than that. But he also saves you from the many things in this life that cause you hurt and pain, and that's great news. That's, where, that's how we're being saved. We're being saved from our old sinful ways. We've been given a new way of life. And the church of Macedonia was exploding because people were repenting of their sins and, and their sinful ways and they were placing their trust in Jesus and in what he had done for them. You see, Christ's sacrifice for us and his love for us compels us, his followers, to love others as well. So here at Calvary, we do love one another. I, I see it. I, I do. I, 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 somebody said this morning in Bible group, you don't have to like them, but you got to love them, right? Sometimes we have problems. Sometimes we have disagreements. Sometimes people do things or say things that hurt us. But you know what? Generally, here at Calvary, we have to love one another. And then... We also have to love our neighbors. We, we have to love our neighbors. Uh, 
Yeah, you know, and we do. We do love our neighbors, and that's great. But again, look what it says here in verse 10. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Love more. Love each other more and more. Love your neighbor more and more. Even if they have a Trump sign in their yard, even if they have a hair sign in their yard, love your neighbor. Why? Because through the Holy Spirit, we have God's love dwelling in us. And when we, we give it out to other people, the church will grow. It's as simple as that. And to do that, to grow in love, we must live in the habit of love. And I call it a habit because these are some things, well, let's, let's read it. Verse 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands, just as I told you, so that your daily life may win over the respect of outsiders, and so you will not be dependent on anybody. There are bad habits, and there are good habits. I've had a few bad habits, and they are hard to break. The good habits, though, the irony here is that the good habits that we're supposed to be doing are hard to get started, and they're hard to continue do, to do. Good habits, hard to get rid of. Bad habits, hard to get rid of. Good habits, hard to get started, hard to keep going. And I believe Paul here is giving us a possibility. What is possible in the church? What is possible in your life? This is the ideal condition for the church and its members. This is a target we aim to hit. This is our ambition, our goal. These habits that Paul is encouraging us to have here is something that we aspire to. He says, make it your ambition, set a goal, get on it, get it done. There's energy here. There's, there's an ambition. This is, your, this is your goal. This is your, it's like when you aim. When you shoot a bow, you, you aim at your target. You, there's energy in there. It's in your muscles. You, you, you pull back on the string, you can feel it. And you release the string and the arrow's on its way to the target. Make it your ambition. You know where you draw, you aim. This is from, from center shot. You draw, you aim, shot set up, right? You make it your ambition. You're, you're aiming at that target to lead a quiet life. Release, follow through, reflect. And then to mind your own business and get to work. Those are the aims. Those are the goals. That's the target. See, way too many Christians are living a chaotic life. Way too many Christians live in chaos. Now, sometimes things get hectic because of no fault of our own, but many times we bring chaos on ourselves. I see it quite often. Chaos in someone's life is, is because that's all they know. That's what, how they know to live. That's That's... They, the way they were raised, that's how they grew up in the house of chaos. It was this, it was that. And they bring that into their own family and then they pass that on to their children and it's just like chaos all the time. Maybe that's all you know because you've never knew what peace and, and quiet was. God wants you to live a quiet life, not a frantic life. If anyone should be frantic here, it's the Thessalonians who are being persecuted because of their faith. Many have probably lost family relationships over their faith. Many have lost their homes or jobs, and maybe they've been arrested or been harassed incessantly by their neighbors or even beaten. But they are still to live a quiet life and in the process, not be a busybody. How many of you have ever worked with a busybody? Okay, you know who I'm talking about. The person who is more concerned about what everyone else is doing than doing anything themselves? Enough said. Don't be that person. Number one, because it's not what a follower of Jesus is supposed to be doing. And number two, because it's not a good witness because no one likes a person who sticks their nose into other people's business. And then Paul says to work hard no matter what you do. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work with it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that it is from the Lord you receive an inheritance, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Living a quiet, restful life can unfortunately come with some drawbacks as well. People can become lazy. 
Obviously, this was happening in Thessalonica. Uh, People can become lazy and to guard against people becoming too relaxed in life. Paul told them to keep busy, get to work, provide for your family. In short, if we as followers of Jesus live in a habit of loving and living like we see here in this passage, we would then be an example everywhere. Verse 12. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Why should we develop good godly habits and live, of living peaceably, minding our business and working hard? So that we can be an example to others. So that the ones who are constantly stirring up the trouble, the, the busybodies who are always sticking their nose in and other people's business, the lazy people who find it acceptable to be dependent on others, will see the difference in you. They'll see that you don't join in when the gossip starts. You, you walk away when they're doing things that you, shouldn't, you know you shouldn't be doing and you decline their invitation when they invite you to go places you know you ought not to go. So that good habits you form in your daily life may win the respect of people who don't know Jesus. So that you can become an example of what a Christian should be. So when Timothy went to check in on this church, there must have been some thought that, uh, of somehow, they must have thought somehow that they missed something, that, that they were going to miss something, or those who already died in Christ would miss out on the resurrection. And what we see here is understanding that produces hope. Verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will, not, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. This is a well-known passage. It is read many times at funerals. I use this myself at, at some funerals. But the reality is here, we don't really know what the believers in Thessalonica was wondering about. They appear to be upset concerning what happens to the dead and the living when Jesus returns. The question may have well been, before Jesus comes back, what happens to the believers who die? Will they miss his return? Paul wrote back, said, let me fill you in, brothers and sisters. Let me, let me help you understand what's, what's going to happen here. Let me help you understand what you don't know. And in doing so, I'm, I hope it will bring you hope and peace and comfort. We don't want you to be ignorant, he said, about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Those who fall asleep and the, is those who have passed on from this life into the next. Sleep is a euphemism for death, mainly because for, to the observer, sleep and death look the same. The body lays still. But even at that, Paul says, for those who believe, there is hope. Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us God has placed the concept of eternity in each of our hearts. That is, everyone should know that there's, there's something more than this life. There's, there's a life after this one. But back then, even like it is today, there's, there's atheists. There's people who, who believed only in themselves and there was nothing like that. They, they had this atheistic philosophy back then that said, I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. Basically meant, we're born, we live, we die, who cares? God cares. God absolutely cares. That, and he cares that you have an understanding and a hope for your eternal future. Because what it boils down to is that our hope starts with trust. Verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Right there, beginning of verse 14, and it goes on. We believe. We believe. Paul here is speaking for all Christians because you can't be a Christian if you don't believe. If you don't believe that Jesus actually died and physically and bodily rose again. Not only do we believe this and trust in this, 
We can have confidence in this. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits from those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. All this to say, since Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and is alive today, all who trust in him will be raised and given new bodies. 1 John 3, 2 says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I believe the next and the only sign of end times is the rapture of the church. That's what we're seeing here in 1 Thessalonians 4. All these end time experts that give a date or predict when, God, when Jesus is going to return, I got to tell you, they don't know anything. All they're doing is selling books. All I know is the rapture is the next event that starts the clock on all end time events. When that happens, I don't know. But when a believer dies, their body is placed in the ground and their soul, that is who they are on the inside. That is their, their life force, their personality, everything that makes that person that person, but without an earthly body, is with the Lord. Paul said that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, paraphrasing 2 Corinthians 5.8. He also wrote in Philippians chapter 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for you, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better, but if more necessary for you, I remain in the body. Now, here's the thing. Some don't believe there's going to be a rapture, nor do they believe in a literal millennial thousand-year kingdom reign of Jesus. Theologians call this end times view a millennialism. There are those who believe in a literal thousand year kingdom with Jesus being king over all the earth, but they don't believe that the rapture will happen before the tribulation. Some believe that the rapture will happen in the middle of the tribulation. Some people believe it'll happen at the end of the tribulation. I had a discussion with a lady at uh, Syracuse Baptist, and she says, well, I believe, you know, I'm, I'm a post-tribulation post uh, person. I think it's, we're going to live through the tribulation. I said, well, I said, if you want to do that, you can, but I want to be gone. I don't want to live during the tribulation, right? We're going to get to some of that here in just a second. And, and none of these views on different end times views have any bearing on anyone's salvation. I want to be clear on that. Your end view, your end time view is not essential for you to, for, to have it right in order to be saved. Does that make sense? The way you view the end time is not essential that you have to have it right or you're not saved. But after all my studying on this topic, after reading stacks of theology books, as well as piecing together scripture that speaks to such matters, I would call myself a pre-tribulation rapture person, right? Jesus is going to come and rapture the church before the tribulation starts. I'm a premillennial kind of guy. Jesus is going to come back then and reign here for a thousand years. Okay? And that's why I teach it. Meaning I believe that Jesus will come like we see here and with him with all those who have trusted in him, who have, who have passed, who have died. The dead in Christ will rise not to get their old worn out bodies, but to receive a new eternal body. And then those who are believers who are alive will then also get a new body as we meet Jesus in the air. Now this might sound like a fairy tale. It might sound like this is, this is something out of, way out of the ordinary, and it is, because it's a God thing. This is where our faith rests. This is our hope that we have, because if we just have hope in this life, as 1 Corinthians says, we are to be people most pitied. Then for, and then after Jesus comes back, the rapture of the church and the seven years of tribulation begins. Paul tells these Thessalonian believers, don't worry, you won't miss it. See, they was worried they was going to miss it somehow, or the people who died before was going to miss it. He says, don't worry, because Christ's return will be unmistakable. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. I don't know what the trumpet call of God sounds like. I don't know what the voice of the archangel sounds like, but I'll know it when I hear it. I'll know it when I hear it. That's for sure, because it'll be unmistakable. As I said, Lord willing, I, I'm going to have a new sermon series ready to go. First of the year, I've been reading, I've been studying about heaven and what we as believers are going to be doing in heaven and, and all of that. And as a side study, I've been studying about the rapture and end times and rewards and judgments and all that's been on my radar. What I can say this morning is this, and I fully believe this because God's word is true. First and foremost, Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. It could be today. Yay, right? It could be next month. It could be 10 years from now. We don't know. All I know is that we need to be ready. We need to be ready. You, you need to be ready by turning from your sin and putting your faith in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross in order for you to be saved. That's the first and foremost thing you, they have to be to be ready is trust in Christ. And as people who already believe, we need to be ready too. By living the kind of life that pleases God. A life that is different than the godless people around us. And I'm telling you, as I read like books like 1 Thessalonians and, and, and all these other places where Paul walked into and the things that were going on in, the, in those communities and those cultures, it's like, oh my goodness, we're just like that now. We're getting to be just as bad as they were. What changed their culture? What changed the world? Jesus Christ and his message, the good news, the gospel. So we need to be, live a life different than the godless people around us. A life as an example to everyone we come in contact with. I had a young lady tell me that she thought all this talk about the rapture and Jesus coming back was scary stuff. I said, no way, because it's going to be the best day ever. Best day ever. Until then, though, remember God's promise. Last part of verse 17. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Remember God's promises. We will be with the Lord Jesus forever. Not a scary thought at all. It's a wonderful thought. It's the only hope that we have as believers and followers of Christ. A couple more promises and then we're going to close. John 10, 28. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me, Jesus said, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And of course, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize that for certain Jesus is coming back. You see the way the world's going. You see things that's going bad. You, you know it just can't keep going on like this. And it's like, you know what? I, I do believe Jesus is coming back. And you know that you've never put your faith in Jesus. You've never really trusted Jesus. You've never turned from your sin and said, Lord Jesus, I trust you with my salvation. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my eternity. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. Today would be a fine day to do so. To do that. So if the Spirit of God has touched your heart this morning, you'd like to repent and trust in Jesus, I'll be up front here as we sing our closing song, and I'll be glad to help lead you into a new and exciting relationship with the Lord Jesus. There's a purpose in our waiting for Jesus. Live godly, pleasing lives, be an example to others, and wait for others to come to him to be saved. Let's pray.